This is going to be a special edition of Learning Matters, a bridge to practice. Today, we have with us Mark Halverson, who serves as the Associate Dean of the BA Leadership Program here at Trinity Western University. First of all, Mark, welcome. How are you doing today? Thanks, Scott. I'm doing great. So, Mark, Trinity Western is embracing this multi-access modality as we anticipate what we may be experiencing um, this fall, because we're not quite sure what's going to happen in terms of students on campus, students off campus, and, and we're trying to plan accordingly. Can you talk a little bit from your experience how you frame multi-access? Thanks, Scott. This is a great question. I've had a few um, opportunities to actually practice multi-access um, kind of models of running my course. One of the first experiences I had uh, recently was when we had the snowstorm in the spring. Mm. And, you know, why, what that opportunity availed to me was that I had half the students that actually came to class, half the students that couldn't make it to class, and I had two other students that were on business trips. And so it created a perfect opportunity. I didn't realize how important it was going to be at the time to kind of go through that experience. But let me share a little bit about what I did. So I, I started the class just as I normally would. I have my laptop. I, ha I mic myself in, was just using my iPhone um, headset so that I had audio that was recorded and it was a reasonable quality of recording. Um, so I, had, I used Zoom and I had the students that were off-site come in through Zoom. And one of the challenges that you know, this kind of model presents is that... Um, Everything takes a little bit longer is what I found. Mm -hmm. So this, the solution that seemed to work really well was just to be a little bit more intentional about how I facilitated the sessions. I also had to think about how I was going to provide recordings for those students that weren't there. So what I did is I broke the class, which was a three-hour class. So that's kind of a long time for people to be all sitting there. I broke it into three parts. We set out the agenda before so everyone knew what the plan was going to be. So we started recording and I just sat there in front of the students and I went through my normal kind of lecture and discussion. I, I broke it up so we could kind of pause and ask questions. Um, and one of the things I found at that kind of juncture was to not do my normal thing of just kind of looking around and raising hands and that kind of thing that we typically do as instructors. But I had a class list with me and I just was very intentional in you know, asking you know, different students, can you respond to this question? And I would just check off names as we went through so everyone got to participate and everyone got to engage in the class. And so that, that first part of the class, that was kind of walking it through in about an hour. And so I stopped the recording at that point. I, I put up a notice on my screen to say, you know, back in 15 minutes, so everybody knew what time we're coming back, both the students that were in class, the students that were live in Zoom. Um, and I would just cut that part out for the students that couldn't attend. Um, so then we would come back. We did the second uh, part of the class in a similar kind of uh, format. Um, was able to, you know, even do some kind of small group activities where, you know, students in the class, they were physically doing activities together. And then the students online, they could be in, you know, a, a group online and Zoom just having a, a, a peer conversation. Um, and, you know, I asked this, you know, um, students, you know, who couldn't be there. So, you know, what we what we did is I, I found some alternate recordings of those activities that those students could also see. So the students who weren't part of the class would would know um, what was going on. And they could still connect to other activities like papers and assignments that they would need to, to know those things for. So that would kind of broke it into the second part and then you know, had another break again. You know, making sure that I communicated that information to all students um, so they know when to come back and then, you know, wrap up the class. So then when, it, when my whole class was done, you know, what, what, what I did is took all those recordings and then made those recordings available to, you know, um, the students that, that couldn't be there. So it, it used the skills that I have as an instructor that I already know, and I just adapted some easily accessible technologies so that I could create this format of engaging both students that were in the classroom, students that were live but uh, away from the classroom, and, and students that could see the recordings afterwards. Um, so th those are some of the things that I did in terms of that my first kind of multi-access experience. 
Um, so that was really kind of a exciting opportunity and I think it worked pretty well. And my hope is that kind of can create a bit of a template or prototype that other faculty that are, you know, going into this journey of figuring out how to do uh, multi-access education might want to use. Yeah, I, I remember that that snowstorm and it was actually a Friday and Trinity Western, the campus was closed in the morning and then it was going to be open in the afternoon. Well, my course starts at 12 o'clock and I had a three hour drive from Seattle to Vancouver that Friday and I didn't know should I get on the road and will they open campus or won't they? So I made the decision to stay in Seattle and 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 alert my students whether or not class would be open at noon. And then they made the announcement at 11.30. So we set that up as a multi-access. And I had probably six students actually in the classroom itself together. I think I had two students in a library, another two students in a, in a coffee shop and the rest were at home and I was in Seattle and we managed the course via zoom and we also recorded the course and it was a, a really interesting sort of toe in the water moment on how this could actually work to allow students to access the, 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 the lecture, the demonstration, the learning activity, and, and the assessments all in this multiple way. The, the interesting feedback that I got that, that I found really, really powerful was I had a three hour class and I filled that entire three hours. Mm -hmm. And the, the amount of Zoom fatigue, <laughs> yeah. you know, was, was, was I, that's the, because I asked my students at the end of every class to give me a wow and give me a wonder. And one of the wows was, wow, we could all be together even though we're not in the same place. I wonder, Scott, if you could play less video clips <laughs> or let us watch the video on our own time because we could get a better quality. And, it, and then after a while, we just sort of, it just sort of zoned out. And we weren't getting this information. So getting a chance to play with this uh, format, I think was really helpful for me to understand the affordances and the constraints. Yeah. And, you know, what, what are some other things, Scott, that you tried in terms of yeah. trying to get the students to engage? Well, one of the things that I did, and I'm going to share my, my screen again, is I made use of breakout rooms. And, and mm. I do a lot of turn, talk, share in my classrooms already. How can I do that when I know I have students together, students separate? So for the students that were in the room, they had their groups, but students who were in different places via Zoom, they could go into their breakout rooms. And then I could give them a prompt and the discussion, and then they would have to identify someone in that particular room when they came back to report out what was discussed. And that worked pretty well, but then I realized, hmm, maybe we can even do one better. So I'm gonna share my screen right now. And, and one of the things that I did is that I created a Google Doc. And then when the students were in the breakout room, they had to write their, their names and which room they are in, and it gave them the ability to take notes on their discussions. In this case, the question was, why do some ideas slip out of the grasp of well-positioned incumbents and then thrive in the hands of startups? And this was response to a uh, podcast that I had them listen to, which was I considered one of the readings, readings for the course. What I, what I discovered is I was then able to have my students use these notes in a generative way as they prepared for the final exam because there was a version of this question on the final exam and they had access to the harvest of their distributed funds of intelligence, if you will, in terms of the, the conversations that they had. So I think that, that, that proved to be a really um, interesting affordance that um, Zoom and breakout rooms, along with uh, uh, a web-based note-taking, uh, created for, for the students in this course. Yeah, and Scott, when, when, it, when you just uh, shared your screen there, one of the things that I noticed was that you made it very clear when the break times were. Mm -hmm. And I, I know one of the things I found in doing just multimodal ac access is for having people that are offsite 
really thinking through the agenda or schedule that you have in the class and then communicating, you know, what is happening when. And I found that having that extra planning made the classes go much smoother. It also allowed me to kind of think through in advance, what do I need to capture for students that aren't going to be there? And so I could make sure that the students would know what they need to do if they weren't participating in the class and um, to create alternate uh, activities if, if students um, couldn't be engaging with the, the act, actual activity that you know, I'm reporting. So one of the things that I found in this notion of sc- the screen mediated way of teaching and learning is that I have to be very intentional mm-hmm. and help scaffold and, and be a guide, if you will, for my students of what we're doing and when we're doing that. And it really forced me to rethink and reimagine and thus realign what are, what are the learning goals? What are the learning goals that really matter here? And then what are those lectures, learning activities, readings? How do they line up for our students? And that, you know, that took a little bit of a rewiring for me to get there. Yeah, I went through the a similar ex- experience just in terms of thinking through my own mindset. I, I'm a kind of instructor that's um, much more natural when I'm just in front of the classroom and I can walk around and be in different parts of the room and, and use the space. And so just sitting in front of my uh, computer screen, that takes a whole different kind of mindset in terms of how I create engagement in the class. Um, so one of the things that that kind of uh, you know maybe is a question for you is uh, how how did you kind of go through that shift of you know being kind of physically in the space and engaging students to then creating that kind of same engagement in front of the screen? Um, one step at a time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, part of it was rooted in the type of learning environment that I want to create, which mm-hmm. is a collaborative interactive, where I want my students to really own their learning and then be able to bring what they are learning into the course. And I do a lot of project-based learning and even case studies, if you will. So since I had that frame of mind already, I, I had to really go through, well, what works well in this environment and what doesn't work well? Because I don't want to do, try to do things that, that are problematic, but I, I had to try some things and not everything worked. But I think that's okay. And I think the students understood that because I was also very occurrent or transparent on, look, we're in this space together. We're figuring this out. But because I place a high value on who you are as a learner, I want you to be bringing your feedback and your thoughts onto what's working in this environment. And I think that sort of iterative process of listening was really mm-hmm. important. That's great, Scott. Uh, when I when I was doing the um, multi-axis kind of approach in my course, one of the things that students really appreciated that I did was at the end of um, every uh, class, um, I would create a um, basically a task list for them of what they needed to do that particular week. So I, I just, if I can, just share um, what I've. Uh, example of what I write for my students. Mm-hmm. So as you can see here, this is uh, week three for the, the course, and I just outlined this, the study tasks that they should uh, be looking at. So I, I write you know, what the tasks they're going to do in terms of writing their forum posts, give them instructions, give them some guidance, just as I would be sharing with them if I was talking to them in class. Um, talk about papers that are ongoing. So in this example, they're doing a personal mastery paper, and it's not due until week five. But I'm telling them what they should be doing this week so that they can stay on task and they can be doing what they need to do so they're not overwhelmed overall throughout the course but they're focusing on just what they need to do at every single week of the course yeah yeah giving yeah yeah, giving them examples of other activities so here I, i do something called a marshmallow challenge which is something that we do in class and it's a team building activity and so for students that weren't able to participate in that activity what i did is i found um other videos of other teams that did 
did this activity so that they can watch what other teams did. And it's all edited down so it's a little bit shorter. They don't have to watch through the full length of the activity, but they can get a sense of what happened. And then, you know, giving them some um, other resources in terms of another debrief video that helps them understand in you know, a very concise way just what was the lessons that we were trying to learn from that activity. So that's kind of an example of how, you know, sometimes you do these, you know, interactive activities in class, but the students in a different time zone don't get to participate. So that's how I was able to help the, them engage and know what was going on. Oh, I, I like this one. I think the other thing that I'm really coming to understand is that, you know, as faculty, we are also resources for each other. Mm-hmm. So, Mark, I'm going to ask you, can you can you send me uh, a little bit more about this marshmallow uh, activity? I think I want to use it in my class. <laughs> that sounds great, Scott. Yeah, it's a, it's a fun activity. It's done all over the world. So uh, I'll, I'll send that with you, to you. Um, so the other thing I just wanted to draw, make a, a connection here is that most of our courses as faculty have a lot of readings in it, but we're not necessarily wanting to... Um, have the students read everything in depth. And so one of the things that can really help um, all learners, not just learners who are remote, is to help them focus on what part of the readings you want them to focus on, what Mm -hmm. kind of questions you want them to be asking about those readings, and and making connections in terms of how the readings um, will help them in particular um, projects like papers. And so that's another thing that I've done in this example. I like this. And and it it reminds me of um, Colin Madlen would say that, look, Moodle doesn't teach. Zoom doesn't teach. Teachers teach and learners learn. And it's our job to create the best environment that's going to support that teaching and learning. Absolutely. And one of the things, you know, I think we can do in terms of, you know, just thinking a little bit more um, aspirationally in terms of what we can do, you know, starting with a multi-access kind of model where we're just extending what we do uh, in our everyday, you know, face-to-face teaching by using Zoom and similar technologies to record the experience and share them with other students in other places. You know, not everybody has access to the internet with the same level of bandwidth. And so right. one of the things we can begin layering on to our courses is text-based support. And so one of the things, you know, I've started to do, and then this is a bigger project. It takes a lot more time to kind of capture, you know, your, your notes and your teaching in text form. But it's something you can begin to do where you just start... Uh, translating your lecture notes into something that students can read. And and so that's something you can do. And even if you just have a few parts of your course where you can do this, it allows you to give more options to your students to access the content. And what I've shown here is just put draft on it. You know, it's not not yet finished. It can be a work in progress, but at least you're giving additional resources that the students can have access to to help them succeed in your course. Yeah, I like the the notion of Multiple resources. <laughs> yes. Um, I, I would like to share something real quick. If uh, yeah, absolutely. We're, we're going to have to shop the, swap the share modes. So one of the things that I, I actually did after I finished and handed in my grades just a little bit ago to uh, um, MCOM 313 Social Media Theory and Practice is I actually created a, a web story um, detailing what we did in, did in the classes we made this shift. And so I can make this available but uh, this planning ahead notion, I think, is really key. <laughs> being, mm-hmm, being, being able to also, though, go with the flow, slow things down, and let students also understand we're in this together, and just take it, you know, basically a step at a time. And what we're able to do in this, in this course is that I usually do this social presencing exercise where students introduce themselves. They say their name, how they would like their name pronounced, and what they hope to learn from this class. Then they toss it to someone else. And then we go around the room and people have to repeat what they just heard. And then I ask the question, are you listening to what the person Mm -hmm. is saying? Are you thinking about what they're going to say? It's a really interesting exercise to do face to face. But I didn't know how that would work. But when I got to the end of the class... We did the same exercise um, after the uh, final exam, and I asked them, what did they get out of the class? And we actually did that. And if you go to the website, I won't play the video now. We played the same game, but using Zoom. 
and it, it, it worked out. It worked out pretty well. So there are some things that you can do um, that that you, you're not using Zoom to replace, but you can use it in a way I think to even go a little deeper sometimes. But it takes a little bit of a design to think about how the best ways to do it. Yeah, and Scott, what really excites me about the example you just showed is that it demonstrates a best practice in this kind of education, which is to engage the learners in the classroom to help partic participate in the production of resources for other students in the classes, right? right? right, right. And I think that's just a, you know, an excellent e example. Well, well, Mark, um, we're going to wind up this special edition of Learning Matters, A Bridge to Practice. I want to thank you for your time. I want to thank you for your commitment and, and, and uh, the guidance you're providing, not only to your students in the classroom, but in your role as associate dean, helping to uh, help others think about their transformation and evolution of their pedagogy. Thank you, Scott. It's been a pleasure to just have a conversation with you about some of the practices that we can engage to uh, make our courses more accessible, especially as we go through these difficult and trying times. Yep. You've been listening and watching Learning Matters, A Bridge to Practice, and we'll be together again real soon. Mm -hmm.